Hi folks. Thematically, much of the uh, Anglo-Saxon literature that we have available deals with the passing of things, the transitory nature of life, of all human achievements, all human endeavors. Beowulf, have we been doing Beowulf? Well, we have two big triumphs, but our third part of Beowulf, Beowulf meets the dragon, meets his weird, the weird of all. He dies a proper heroic death, but yes, he dies, and not only does he pass away, but his kingdom, that of the Geats, it is utterly destroyed. With Beowulf gone, it is conquered. It reaches its end. Now, we are looking at these Exeter elegies, this collection, and we find a general theme running through them. Loss. Yes. When we lose all that we have had in this life. It is transitory, it goes, and that is the human weird. Weird. That Norse notion of fate or destiny figures in here. All things pass away as part of destiny, and through this, we see in these elegies an edge, an uneasy transition. We seem to be seeing the passing of their time values, their world as it is pushed aside or goes aside in the name of the Christian tradition. Uh, the area was Yes, converted by the sword in this period, so we see these old values passing on. Name, remembrance, worldly fame, these things that were to be their desires. The great glory of dying with one's gold and such that we would see in a Norse burial. Gone, and instead or rather poorly substituted, and almost a throw-in in the words in some of these poems, there are a new set of life's designs and desires, the desire for heaven, salvation, and such, which comes at the end of this worldly wandering. A worldly wandering that is often a fair bit painful. The wanderer really strikes these chords. Our wanderer is a man, our narrator, a man whose clan has been lost or destroyed. He is alone. He's condemned to wander the world. And the poem centers on his loss. He is continuing through life with resignation. That's for the loss. Let us read the extent of it, you will want to read carefully his little journey through weird. Remember, read reading these poems, read the words, follow them. But we want to grab particular lines here. Where has the horse gone? Where is the rider? Where is the giver of gold? Where are the seats of the feast? Where are the joys of the hall? Oh, the bright cup, oh, the brave warrior, the glory of princes, how the time has to weigh, slipped into nightfall as if it had never been. As if it had never been. All of the things of this life are forgotten and gone. Wealth is fleeting. Friends are fleeting when we move on down. Man is fleeting, woman is fleeting. Our lives are fleeting. As I said, we have a little Christian throw-in at the end, a reconciliation. 
It will be well for the one who seeks mercy, consolation from the Father in heaven, where for us all stability stands. Why am I calling that a throw-in? Because it really doesn't show up until the very end. Seems a toss-in. I won't call it uh, insincere. I don't go around assuming these things are insincere. I wonder if it was added by someone, some later person from the original writer or speaker who added that uh, there's a little touch at the end, though, the requisite Christian touch, because we are in this period this, with this sense of transition. That transition is easier to see with the seafarer because the poem seems to divide into two rather sharp halves. Well, the greater part of this is the latter portion, but our seafarer begins bragging, bragging at not what he's attained, but what he has endured, his strength and power as he has gone to sea taken on all sorts of misfortunes, battled through it, and he is celebrating his strength. Then, along about line 38, and so no man on earth is so proud in spirit, nor so of old in deeds, that he never has sorrow over his seafaring when he sees what the Lord might have in store for him. And bang! transition as the rest of the poem then is on the worthlessness of all these earthly attainments the lord has other things in store you should be focused instead on that one true hope heaven so a poem of conversion a celebration of shifting values Perhaps so. And with both of them, we see this sense of a passing world. Now, the wife's lament. I really like this one. I like the first one a lot. And I like this one a lot. don't like the seafarer as well, but... Uh, it doesn't seem to me to quite be as well done. We noted the that more modern message deliberate in it. We will, in the wife's lament, have more of this sense of this older world because who is she? She is one who is dead. I do not know under what circumstances, but I make this song of myself deeply sorrowing, suffers, and so forth. And then at line 27, they forced me to live in a forest grove, under an oak grove, in an earthen cave. The earth hall is old and I ache with longing. The dales are dark, the hills too high, harsh hedges overcome with briars, a home without joy. Folks, she's inside a grave. She's in a grave. She's dead. She is in an earthen cave. She's beneath a tree, so she is buried. The hills are too high. She cannot get out of the grave. You know, you aren't allowed to get out of the grave. It doesn't work that way, folks. And all the rest. Folks who have worked with this poem are less certain about the meaning, or at least the editor says they are. I'm, uh, I'm going to be adamant on this. I'm not really an expert here in the area, but uh, this flat out reads to me as she's describing her grave. She's dead, and she is filled with longing because who do you share your grave with? Nobody. She is alone, alone there waiting, waiting for her husband's return, waiting, I guess, for his death with the notion of reunion after death, otherwise just waiting alone to slowly fade away, which would be in the style of the Norse, Norse realm of hell. 
And the ruin takes us again to this sense of desolation, the destruction of all things. Here we have, rather than human lives, rather than that man lost, lost from his clan, his clan departed in, in the wanderer, or our buried wife lamenting her fate, here we have a city, and it is gone. Wondrous is this foundation. The fates have broken and shattered this city. The work of giants crumbles. The roofs are ruined. The towers toppled. Frost in the mortar has broken the gate, torn and worn and shorn by the storm, eaten through with age. And the poem continues to its end in the same vein. Because what happens to all? human works, all our edifices, all our wonderful cities, they fall. That Norse civilization or their place, their places of ascendancy were short-lived. They fell rather rapidly. Visibly, people, those writing, were seeing their fall. Transitory the example of all things, but this Norse culture, as we understand it, as it came to our written world, old world that we are with here in England, there seems a pervasive interest in decline, death, inevitable suffering, inevitable failure. All human accomplishments will fall and be forgotten. All is transitory. All is taken over by the vines and ruin of time. All will become desolate. This appears from the Exeter Elegies, a fairly pervasive theme. And as I suggested, it reflects the same kind of theme and scene that we see at the tail end of Beowulf. It is mentioned in Beowulf in the interpolated stories in front of the Mead Hall, how such a man was great and such a man was mighty and uh, fell. It's the nature of these little kingdoms of conquest to fall. And the nature suggested in uh, the, at the end of Beowulf as the Geats fall for them to pass entirely from this earth. And likewise here throughout, how transitory are our earthly things. And so that is our transitory visit to some old English poetry.